Hey everybody, how's it going? My name's Sophie and this is Crime and Paint, where I'm going to sit down, talk about a true crime case while I work on paint. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to be sitting down talking to you about a crime story that has just, um, I don't know, that has me fascinated this week. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to be painting. So if crime is something that you're interested in, I would love for you to stick around. Maybe like the video, subscribe, you know, while you're here, you might as well. <laughs> so today I'm going to be talking about family slaughterer John List. I'll give you a little background on him first. So, John was born in 1925 to his father of the same name and to his mother, Alma. Now, his family was, well, yeah, they were very strict Lutherans, um, and they kind of instilled those values onto John as well, especially his mom. She was very... Uh, what's the right way to say, like a little controlling in a loving way though. She wanted to keep him close. She was concerned about him getting corrupted by the outside world. So she didn't really like let him have friends or anything like that, which led to John being very antisocial. Like he just, he was a mama's boy. Uh, you know, he just sat at home reading his Bible. He didn't really have friends. He didn't really learn how to socialize ever. So cut to years later when World War II was escalating, John ended up enlisting in the army as a lab technician. Eventually he got discharged and then he went and he got his master's in accounting. So he was really big on numbers. Like he was a smart guy. Um, but unfortunately, before he could really do anything with that degree, uh, the Korean War was underway and he ended up going back into the army. Uh, there he was stationed in Virginia where he met a widow, Helen, and her daughter, Barbara. Uh, so Helen's husband had died um, in World War II, so she was single and her and John just kind of hit it off. They kind of liked each other. They started dating and shortly thereafter, uh, Helen told John that she was pregnant. So like the good Lutheran boy that he was, he decided the right thing to do would be to marry her. Uh, but unfortunately, about like two months after they were married, he found out that she actually wasn't pregnant, like at all, like she never was. So that probably put a little bit of, you know, some, some bad feelings into their marriage, but it didn't end their marriage. After all, John was a Lutheran and part of his faith was that, you know, divorce was bad, you don't do it. And it was like, you know, 50, like late 50s at this point, so you, you definitely didn't do it. So uh, after he gets out of uh, the army again, uh, he ends up getting a job in Detroit. Uh, so he moves there with Helen and Barbara, and that's where him and Helen kind of settle down and they start to have kids. Very close in succession, they have three children. Uh, and then in 1960, Barbara ends up getting married and she moves out of the household. Good for Barbara. <laughs> so another thing that you need to know about John is that, you know, because of his lack of social skills, he tended to lose jobs frequently and then he would get like another job and then the family would move. So they did a lot of like moving around because uh, he just couldn't hold a job. He just rubbed people the wrong way. Like everybody always said like he was a very hard worker, but he just, his personality just wasn't great and he just, you know, had a hard time keeping anything. 
Eventually though, John got this great job in Jersey City at a bank and it was like a higher level, like he was finally getting like a good amount of money, like it seemed stable. So he takes the family again and they move and they end up getting this beautiful Victorian mansion with 19 bedrooms in Westfield, New Jersey. And, the, and you know this place was fancy because it had its own name. It was called Breeze Knoll. Talk about fancy, right? I don't know, do any of you have a house with like a name like that? I, that's just like so beyond me. Or do you just name your houses for fun? Like I wonder if they came up with the name or if like the name was already there. Do you, does anybody know? I would love to know. I, I tried to look it up, but uh, all I know is that the place w was named Breeze Knoll. <laughs> Not important. Okay, let's get back to the story. So now, as you can imagine, this house was was not cheap. Like, it was expensive. And though John had a really good job, he couldn't afford it all by himself. So he actually got help from his mother, Alma, uh, to purchase the estate. Uh, it was like, it was his wife Helen, I believe. That's what I've read in a couple different articles. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But it seems like it was really like Helen who wanted this place. Like it was like her dream house. I mean, honestly, I think it would be most people's dream house. I mean, a 19 bedroom Victorian mansion. Who wouldn't want that? Anyway, so he gets uh, his mother, Alma, to help with the down payment, and she actually ends up moving in with them into the third floor. So they kind of make like the third floor her own private apartment. I mean, they have the room, you know? <laughs> so from the outside at this point, John's life is looking looking pretty good. You know, he's got these like three beautiful kids, uh, his, you know, his wife, his mom's living with them. They're in this beautiful house. He's got a great paying job. Everything looks great from the outside. But as we know, you can't always tell from the outside if things are great or not. And they really weren't. Uh, John and Helen's marriage wasn't great. Uh, Helen was really sick at this point. Uh, from her previous husband, she had contracted syphilis. Um, apparently it was like so advanced at this point that like John wasn't at risk of getting it, but Helen, Helen had it. And it was like eating her from the inside, like eating her brain. Like at this point she was, you know, like having symptoms of like Alzheimer's. Like she, her brain wasn't all there. She wasn't all there. She was also addicted to drugs and alcohol. Um, and she would spend most of her days in bed. So at this point, it was really like John taking care of the house, cooking, cleaning, doing everything. And Helen was just, you know, getting worse and worse and worse by the day. And she got like, she would just have these outbursts of like anger. And apparently like she would call him at his jobs and like, yell at him or be like, oh, you have to come back and take care of like the baby or do this or do that. Uh, so their marriage wasn't great, but again, at this time, I, and because of his, you know, beliefs, he can't get a divorce. So he didn't get a divorce and he just stuck it out and probably built up a lot of resentment. Side note here, I am not in any way 100% not victim blaming at all. I don't think anything ever justifies what happens later and I don't think just because you're having a problem with your spouse that murder is ever, ever okay. I just thought I should put that out there in case anyone mistakens me saying that they were having a troublesome marriage as me victim blaming Helen. Definitely not her fault. I mean she had freaking syphilis too. I mean there's people that yell at their spouses and aren't dying from a disease. So then in 1966, unfortunately, John lost his job. So now he no longer had that really good, prestigious paying job. And he lost it again, not because of like anything like having to do with his work ethic, like he was a good worker, but his social skills, no. And he rubbed people the wrong way. So. He got fired 
again. Uh, and this time, instead of, you know, telling anybody and looking for another job, you know, like what a normal person would usually do, John decided that he was going to pretend that he still had the job. Because that's not going to come back and bite you in the ass, you know what I mean? Anyway, so he decided that he was going to pretend that he had the job. So he would still get up every morning, like, give the kids breakfast. They would go off to school. He would dress in his full suit. He would go to the train station. And then he would just, like, sit there, hang out, and, like, read the paper for, like, the whole day. Or, like, take a nap, you know, probably eat something but he would hang out at the train station all day long instead of looking for a job because you know yeah you can hide that for a long time John that's a really good long-term plan <sighs> God, he's so, I get a little frustrated at this point anyway so he doesn't have a job and this goes on for a long time and from what I've like read it seems like he used like some of his mother's money to keep the bills at bay and like even like his two oldest kids like ended up getting a job and like they would give the money to him and like he would use that to like kind of keep debt at bay for a while but eventually you know it caught up like none of them had the money that like he, they would need to keep this um like huge mansion from going into debt you know so after five years yeah, you heard me right. Five years of doing that, pretending to have a job and all that stuff. Finally, the bank starts the foreclosure process on the house. So at this point, you know, John's lies are about to catch up with him. Like, what, what can you do? Like, if, the, if your house gets foreclosed, like, obviously everyone's going to find out that you were lying. What are you going to do, John? Oh, and another thing too, like, I, I don't know, I'll get your grain of salt or like what you guys think about this after, but I, I'm going to tell it just because this is what John says. So part of the reason that John comes up with this whole scheme was because he also believed that his, like, letting the family fall into poverty was bringing sin into the house. Again, like, he was very devout. But I don't know, I feel like some of this logic is a little bit of a stretch. Anyway, he said that, like, he thought that, like, sin was coming into that household. Another thing that he had a problem with was, like, his daughter wanted to be an actress, and he thought that that was very sinful. And it was the 70s at this time, and, you know, 70s were crazy. Everybody was a devil worshiper, and everything was crazy. Uh, so he just believed that the family was falling into sin. So, that's why he started to come up with this plan to, 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 save, to save their souls or whatever. I don't know if I believe it, but... Because to me, I'm like, okay, so you, you, you did what you did. I'll know it. I'll save my thoughts till the end. Anyway, so John decides that he needs to start coming up with a plan to save his family from debt, from sin, from all of this stuff. And what a plan it is. So on November 9th in 1971, the List family starts their day just like any other. The kids get up, they have breakfast, they get ready, they go to school. John gets ready as well, puts on his suit, and then his wife, Helen, comes downstairs to make her morning cup of coffee. It's one thing that she did every single morning, even though she ended up going back up to bed after the coffee, usually. So, she's making her coffee, and while she's doing that, John comes behind her and shoots her straight in the head. <sighs> and then after... He does that, he goes upstairs to his mother Alma's apartment. His mother Alma was 84 at the time, 
And he went up there and of course, you know, she heard the noise downstairs, but she didn't know what it was. So she asked him and uh, he didn't really, re like, he didn't really respond. Uh, and he gave her a kiss and then he shot her in the head as well, killing her instantly. Then he went downstairs, put his wife's body in a sleeping bag and cleaned up the kitchen. He tried to move his mother, I guess he said, but she was too heavy so he covered her in a sleeping bag as well and left her up in the attic. Then John started to get to work on his plan. So what he did is he started to make phone calls and write letters to the kids' teachers and to the school, letting them know that the family was going to be going away for a while to take care of a sick relative. Uh, he also canceled the newspaper, um, the milk delivery, because at this point in time people would get milk delivered to their house like every day. Uh, he also went to like the mail and like told them like, oh, we're going to be gone for a while, so don't, you know, bring mail to the house, leave it here, and like he'll come pick it up when he gets back uh, from like taking care of his family. Uh, he also goes to the bank and that's where he shuts down his account and his mother's account and takes out like a $2,000 savings bond from his mother's account. Uh, then he returns home, you know, he had a very busy morning and now it was lunchtime, so he made himself a sandwich. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he made himself a sandwich and he ate it and he waited for the kids to come back from school. Hmm. The first of his kids to come back is his 16-year-old daughter, Patricia the one who wanted to be the, the actress. Uh, she actually had been feeling sick that day, so she ended up calling John and asking him to bring her uh, home early, uh, which he did. And the minute they got into the house, he shot her right in the back of the head and he killed her instantly. He put her body in a sleeping bag as well and moved her into the ballroom next to her mother's body. Now, the next of his kids to come home was his 13-year-old son, Frederick. And much in the way of everybody else, when Frederick walked into the house, he shot him in the head, killed him instantly, put him in a sleeping bag, and moved his body into the ballroom with everybody else. Now, for his other son, John Jr., things were a little bit different. See, John Jr. actually had a soccer game uh, after school. So, and this, this part, this part makes me a little uncomfortable. This part makes me a little bit like suspicious on John a little bit more like, I don't know, it's just like, how messed up in the head could you be to do this? This part I don't understand. So John ended up going to the soccer game and like sitting there and watching his son John Jr. play the whole entire game. Uh, I saw like an interview and he said like, ugh, he said like, oh, it was a good game. Like it looked like, you know, John Jr. was having fun. Ugh, it's like, it's so awful. So then he brings John Jr. back home and he shoots him. Now, unfortunately, John Jr. struggled and he ended up getting shot like 10 times, which, you know, it's just awful. Like, I mean, you know, I, hopefully he didn't suffer. I hope he didn't suffer. Uh, according to John List, he says that he doesn't think that he did and that he, the only reason he shot him was because his body spasms. But, Geez, like, man, you shot your son over 10 times? That's horrible. <sighs> After he killed John Jr. and put his body with everybody else's in the ballroom, he said a Lutheran prayer over their bodies, and then he went and cleaned up the rest of the blood as best he could, and then he went and he had dinner, and he went to bed. There was like this one interview I saw, and he was like, 
He said something about it being like one of the most restful sleeps he's had in a long time. Which, jeez, man. I'm sorry to paint more aggressively. <laughs> like, ah! <laughs> Ugh, shot. The next morning, he got up and he started to go to work with the rest of his plan. So he went and he turned the air conditioning of the house like up to make the house really cold. Uh, he also turned on like every single light in the house. And before he left, he went to all the family photo albums and he cut out his face. See, kids, listen, this was pre like Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. So if you take out, you know, like physical pictures of the face, the police wouldn't really have anything to go on to like do wanted posters and stuff. So that's what he did. He like removed himself from all the family albums and everything. Then he took the car and he went to JFK Airport and he parked the car like where people who are like going on like long trips would park the car. Then from there he got a bus, went to the city, and then from there he ended up taking a train. He ended up taking this train to Denver where he actually applied for like a new social security card under the name Robert Clark. Which, you know, I, I, is it easy to do that? Is it easy to just like get a new social security card? I feel like it shouldn't be easy. I feel like it isn't easy. I don't know, maybe back then it was easy, but I don't feel like you could just like do that. <laughs> anyway, so he gets like this new identity in Denver and then he ends up becoming like a, like a line cook at a restaurant and just starts a new life. Unfortunately, or fortunately for John, but unfortunately for his family, uh, police didn't come to the house for like almost a month. It wasn't until neighbors started seeing like the lights go out in the house, like just like a light in one room would go off and the light in another one because they, you know, the light bulbs would burn out, uh, that they actually called the police and that anybody came to check out the place. I mean, the List family, you know, like he had kind of covered his tracks pretty good because he had told like the school that they were going to be gone for a while and uh, they weren't really close with any of their neighbors. So nobody really thought anything was suspicious until the lights started going out. So the police do eventually come and when they get there, like they knock on the door, nobody answers, ob obviously. Uh, so they do like a search of the perimeter. Apparently like the neighbors were very adamant that the police like get in there. So the police like looked around and like they peered through the windows and that's where like they saw the bodies like or the, well, the sleeping bags. They saw the sleeping bags in the ballroom. So they end up finding an open window and then they go into Bree's Knoll. This is the part that like when I was growing up like kids would talk about like I don't know if I mentioned this before but like this uh, whole case took place two towns over from where I grew up so like kids talked about it like gossiped about it like almost like it was like an urban legend or something so the so the police go into this place and I forgot to mention this this is part the part that's like super creepy so they walk into this place and there's like this funeral music playing over the speakers in the house. So John, before he left, he had like put music on in the house, I guess, to like make people think that like movement was going on or like people were living in it. So he'd put like this music over the house, but it was like classical music. And like when the police came, they like specifically said like it sounded like a funeral home's music when they walked into this house. That was also ice cold and just so incredibly eerie and creepy at this point. Like all the lights had burnt out and they were looking around and they find the family in these sleeping bags in the ballroom. I can only imagine how horrible and frightening this was. Like, 
it sounds like something out of a movie. Like, it doesn't sound like real life to me, like, at all. Unfortunately, because, you know, Alma was upstairs, like, it took them a while to find her body, but eventually they did as well. So, they start this hunt for John Lifts, but, you know, at this point, it had already been, like, three, almost four weeks, and he was, like, in the wind at this point. And, like I said, like, they didn't have any pictures for the wanted posters. They actually did find his car, but, you know, it was... The car was kind of a red herring because it was parked at the airport so like their first thought was like oh he took a flight somewhere so they tried to like see if like the airport knew of anyone who like fit his description or whatever like took a plane or if like John Liss took a plane anywhere but of course he didn't so that was like a dead end. So John actually didn't get found for 18 years. Can you believe that? 18 years, he started a new life and nobody found him. And the only reason he was found was actually because of a TV show called America's Most Wanted. I don't know how old the people watching this video are going to be, but if you don't know what America's Most Wanted was, like, just trust me when I say this show was, like, the bee's knees back in the day. Like, everybody watched it. Everybody I know watched it. Even people today who really aren't interested, like, interested in true crime at all, they watched this show. Like, it was a big deal. And for this particular episode that featured John List, over, like, 22 million people watched it. That's a lot of people. And lucky for us, and unlucky for John List, one of those 22 million people was Wanda Flannery, who had been one of Robert Clark, or Bob as he liked to be called, neighbors when he lived in Denver. He joined the Lutheran church there, and there he met a woman named... I really can't remember her name. Dolores. He met a woman named Dolores. And he actually ended up getting married again. And they lived there for a while, and they lived next door to Wanda. Wanda's a real MVP with this video. Wanda was watching the show, and on the show, they, I, I don't know where they got it from, I was trying to look this up if you guys know, but like they had like a picture of him from somewhere, because I, I feel like that was part of the problem was why they couldn't find him in the first place. But they found an image of him somewhere, and they used this image, and they got like this crazy good artist to uh, make a bust of like John's face, like what he would look like age 18 years. Uh, and like they like it was just like an incredible bus like I don't know if I can put it in the video somewhere if I can You'll see it and you'll see like how much they look alike and it's like Mind-blowing how amazing this bust is, but if I can't <laughs> figure out how to do this It's going to be like I'm gonna put a link in the, the description so that you can look at the bust because it's like a really good bust any who's old so She's like saw the bust and just like the description like how they described him like always wearing a suit being like you know like a socially awkward like not really like you know talking to people a lot and all this stuff. Wanda was like that sounds and looks exactly like my old neighbor Bob Clark. So she called the hotline, you know, thank God. I feel like there's so many people. This is why I give Wanda like a huge like, you go girl, you go girl. Because I feel like so many people would have just saw that and been like, that bust kind of looks like my one neighbor. And then like, they would have left it at that, you know? Like they would have been like, huh, kind of looks like him. It's probably not him. Because you, most people I feel like we think like, oh, no, like there's no way, but not Wanda. I got you, girl. Good for you. So she called the hotline and, you know, whatever she said convinced them enough that they were like, all right, we're going to go and we're going to talk to this Bob Clark guy and we're going to see if he's John List. 
So that's what they did. And the FBI came to his door and they knocked on it and they were like, excuse me, are you Bob Clark? And he's like, yeah. And they were like, are you also John List? And he was like, no. <laughs> I mean, of course he was like, no. So he said like, no, and he denied it. But off of a like gun prints or something, they were a like he got a gun, like he bought a gun. I, don't quote me on this, but yes, he he got a gun, and because of that, I guess they take your fingerprints, and because of those prints, they were able to prove that he was in fact John List. Ha! Gotcha. 18 years later, but they got you. And in 1990, he was charged with five counts of first degree murder. Finally. Finally. So, that was the case of John List. And, um, you know, it was a rough one. Definitely a rough place to start. But I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you enjoy my painting right here. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully it's right here. <laughs> Anyway, I'm, you know, I'm just getting started, but I plan on posting every Tuesday. I would love to hear your opinions down in the comments below. I'd also like it if you gave me some suggestions of maybe a case I should do next or something that I should look into. And uh, other than that, it was really good hanging out with you guys. I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.